Hello, everyone. Uh, it's always my pleasure to um, host a guest, and uh, especially when I know that uh, so many of you are watching uh, from around the world, and uh, today is no different. Uh, today, uh, I have the very distinct pleasure of hosting Professor Don Cotter Jenkins, uh, who is a speech language pathologist. Uh, Professor Jenkins is a graduate of Stony Brook University in New York, uh, where she obtained her bachelor's degree in linguistics and a minor in Afri African studies. And then she proceeded to obtain a master of arts degree in speech language pathology and audiology uh, from the famed and uh, very prestigious New York University, NYU. And uh, she didn't stop there. She went on to obtain another master's degree uh, and a uh, master of science in uh, healthcare informatics at Adelphi University, where she was also a professor for a bit. And uh, then she holds numerous other certifications in accent modification. And today I'm gonna be asking you how we can modify my accent. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and also she holds uh, certifications in leadership and um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, she is the founder and owner of World Class Speech Services, uh, where she, you know, she runs the whole thing. Uh, her title is CIO, the Chief Information uh, Officer. So Professor Jenkins, welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Oni Sele. So nice to you, be with you. <laughs> likewise, how are you doing today? I am doing well, I'm doing well, it's a good day. Right, let's say I know nothing about speech language pathology. Mm -hmm. What is it? So speech language pathology is actually, uh, encompasses the practice of a variety of different skills that have to do with communication and speaking um, and most of what goes on in this area of your, you know, your, your body, so to speak. So with communication, with voice use, with um, uh, interacting professionally as well as socially. And additionally, we also in the US work with clients that have dysphagia and that is the swallowing and feeding side of things, which is the reason why I said most of what goes on in this part of your body, because we also work with clients who, for whatever reason, whether it's a, you know, a developmental issue or a uh, functional issue post, for example, stroke, um, that they might have problems swallowing. So we would work on swallowing and feeding skills in that manner. So increasing the, the accuracy and the safety of their feeding skills. But mostly, of course, it's got communication, speech, language, and getting my message across to you in some way, shape, or form is oftentimes what speech pathologists do. You know, I tell people, uh, and of course it's a joke, I tell people that I used to be, there was a time in my life when I was very brilliant, uh, you know, when I was a younger person. So, uh, but I did not know what I was going to become or what I wanted to do when I became uh, an adult. It's my understanding that you knew from the time that you were very young that you, were going to, that you wanted to be a speech uh, language pathologist. Will that be accurate? Oh, I wish that that were true. I honestly wish that that were true. I knew that I loved languages and I knew that I loved communication. I thought that I was going to be an interpreter um, for you know the UN. <laughs> if I could have, I would have done that. Um, so I studied languages and as you said before, studied linguistics. But um, actually once I finished studying linguistics was when I really said, um, what do I want to do with this skill? And um, thankfully one of the, uh, I wanna say vice provosts at Stony Brook who was, um, his name was Emil Adams. He apparently had done uh, speech pathology. Um, and so he said, you know, how about you look into speech pathology? And I, I thank God for him saying that to me because I, I needed a little bit more focus and direction of what I, what, what I could do with what I had. So yes, 
that that part came a little bit later. Well, I, I actually, from the answer you just gave, I think there are two things I can deduce. Uh, one is the importance of having mentors. Mm. Uh, and two is the fact uh, that it just seems like um, one can also deduce from that, that there is always a place for us in the world. There's always something for us to do. Maybe you can speak to those two things if you would want. Oh, yes, absolutely. I am a strong advocate for mentorship. Um, even when I was in undergrad, I had a mentor. I was assigned a mentor. They, you know, it was on the application. It said, do you want a mentor in a little box? And I checked it and I got a mentor who was actually in the German department <laughs> at the time. So a German um, man who, who mentored me my first year at Stony Brook. Um, but since then, I've actually become a mentor in the American Speech and Hearing Association for a couple of different programs, um, one of them being the Student to Empowered Professional program in the ASHA Association, and I've been doing that for about eight years. And, um, and I've had mentors also through the years um, as a um, the ASHA program also has a MARC program, which is for people that are in the field already. And so getting uh, mentorship in that way. So absolutely, I strongly, strongly, strongly believe in mentorship and think that we can all um, you know, hold somebody and lift as we climb. Additionally, as you had said, um, yes, you know, if you follow what you enjoy, somehow you will find somebody that might pay you for what you're doing. So um, in that case, uh, like I said, um, I studied languages and I would have enjoyed doing that. I enjoyed talking to people, communicating with people and um, really enjoyed that part of things. So, you know, to be able to hone that particular, I wanna say uh, drive and, uh, hobby, so to speak, if, it, if, if that was all it was in the beginning, it became so much more once I could build the skills, get the degrees and be able to really use it in, you know, new and different ways. So absolutely, there is a place for us all based on our, our talents and interests. Right. You know, I'm listening to you and um, I cannot help but think about the fact that um, I know that you had clinician. Um, I know that you were a clinical supervisor in the master's program at Adelphi University's High Weinberg Speech and Hearing Center. Yes. Uh, and you were also teaching there at the time. So I am wondering how you merge uh, your role as a clinician. And I'm, you know, right now you teach at Emerson. Uh, I wonder how you merge your role as a clinician with your role uh, as uh, a professor and also your role as a businesswoman, and I will discuss that, I want to discuss your business if you don't mind, uh, plus the fact that you are so busy mentoring people, I, I know that for a fact, uh, and traveling the world. I don't know how you merge all of those roles, but for right now, I just like to speak about, and to hear you talk about your roles as a clinician and as an educator. So um, what's interesting for me is that, um, again, uh, I knew, I, I must admit this one, is that I knew that I wanted to be a teacher of some sort <laughs> from when I was very, very young. <laughs> and maybe it was the older sister in me. I'm the, the oldest of four girls. So, you know, I would kind of tell them what to do. But I certainly honed that skill because I really wanted to be a teacher. I was part of Future Teachers of America, which is an association that they have in high school. And I was like, yes, I want to, you know, I want to tutor other people and I want, you know, I want to be you know, helpful in that way. So that was a trajectory that I started very, very early. And I truly enjoy um, getting information from me to others. And the way that, um, you know, uh, I want to say John Maxwell had said a version of, John Maxwell is a uh, leadership um, and speaker, a guru, basically. Um, he had said something, um, in regards to um, educators sometimes making simple things complicated and communicators making complicated things simple. 
And so I always wanted to be that type of professor. I wanted to be the kind of professor that took that complicated um, idea and made it manageable for my students so that they could grasp it, feel that it was their own and be able to enhance their own skills in a particular area. So for me, it was, you know, kind of the, the obvious choice because I wanted to work with adults and not with children. So, um, so, so it, it, it turned into that version of things as a professor and the clinical part of things kind of combines the doing of it, meaning speech pathology, working with clients, knowing how to bring your, um, the person that can't speak and again, because it's about speaking, you're bringing them into being able to communicate with you, to verbalize things, to be clearer in their speech and teaching students who are clinicians, student clinicians at the time, which is almost like mentoring. So it's, it's almost like they build off of each other because again, these were things that I would say were um, of interest to me anyway. And therefore, once the pieces of the puzzle could come together, it felt very natural that I would be a professor and teach certain courses and classes over the years. And God knows it's been a good 15 years that I've taught different classes um, at different universities. And then when I came to Adelphi uh, about five years ago as a clinical supervisor, um, I was able to really, um, you know, add to that skill. And again, that wasn't necessarily the first, the first round of me doing that, but it was something that I had built, built up over those years to be able to work in the clinic, teach courses and feel comfortable doing both. Because in some ways, I think that my personal experiences, of course, as a student 20 years ago were different. And I wanted to be this, you know, this version, I wanted to be my version. I wanted to really hone in for students in the new millennium to be able to really grasp the, the career, be able to you know, feel like they belonged. And, and so I, I, I embraced it. Right. As you know, I am familiar with your work and um, you also know how proud I am of all of the work that you do. And, even though it's difficult for me to keep pace you know, with everything that you do because you are really, really busy. Uh, but one of the things as I'm listening to you, I'm also hearing um, your, not just a love for teaching, but the impact of it and how one of your roles, the role of a connection informs the role of a teacher and vice versa and, uh, you know, and, so I am just wondering, it's really not a good time to ask you this question because uh, there are so many decades of work ahead of you. You know, <laughs> what, yes, you know and uh, you know, I'm so tempted to say, I mean, what is it that you like to see from all of the people you're mentoring right now, uh, either as a clinician or as a professor? What would you like to see from them uh, later, let's say in another 10 years? That's, that's a really, really great question. I mean, students, of course, come with varying levels of skills and varying interests, as you know. Um, they are bringing themselves uh, to the table, so to speak, and I am hopefully giving them a way to be able to express that and advocate for themselves through that process. The truth is that um, because there is for me, a version of, and, and of course it, it should be, a professionalism as well as a friendliness, if possible, <laughs> through that, um, that, uh, you know, truthfully, as we continue to, as I continue to see students who have graduated and what they're doing, whether they're opening their own businesses, frankly, whether they are advocating um, for, um, social justice changes or changes within my career um, in regards to specific areas of study, when they come back to me and they ask me for references and for um, guidance in something, those are the things that really reward me. And the truth is that knowing that 
they feel comfortable after they've graduated to continue to maintain a relationship with me that although, you know, grades were involved and I, you know, kind of run, run uh, my own tight ship with standards for myself and for them, so to speak, um, the idea of them coming back to me and, you know, after they've graduated is, is really rewarding. So for me, really, it's seeing them blossom in the ways that I watched them be able to express themselves through the career. Um, and, um, and, and that's to me, you know, yeah, I, I'm seeing that and I'm getting some of that feedback as far as, you know, students responding because social media and the, the internet has created a closer relationship for a longer, you know, stretch of time. So I think that this is definitely, you know, for me, something that I look forward to seeing in 10, 20, 30 years. I hope that somebody quotes me or says something about me um, that I, you know, influenced them in some way, shape or form. Believe me, somebody, many people will quote you and will say that you influenced them. Uh, but our world has also moved in a different um, way. The trajectory of um, even clinical practice and a kind of clinical practice has shifted uh, somehow. And I have uh, and I know for a fact that you have been at the forefront of telepractice. And right. uh, I, it seems to me that um, the pandemic may have in some way impacted, um, if not the interest at all, but at least the pace at yeah. which you have driven it. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that. Oh, sure. Um, so telepractice was introduced to me um, when I was working with a, a company to, to be able to reach a client that was in Brazil while I was in New York and to be able to work with that client when they were online. And this was my, my first kind of awareness of what telepractice was going to be. I didn't know it as telepractice at the time. <laughs> I didn't have that word in my vocabulary to know that that was what it was going to be. But, um, but thankfully, honestly, this person um, needed me in this situation and I was able to address um, that particular need because what happened was that I was then appointed um, to the New York State Licensing Board for Speech Pathologists and Audiologists. And when, um, and that was in uh, 2013. And when that happened, uh, one of the, you know, one of the people on the board was talking, one of the leaders of the board was saying that we need to have something that um, is going to lead us into this new wave of telemedicine and telehealth and telepractice. And who around the table knows anything about it? And funnily enough, I was the only person, only person on the board that had any experience with telepractice at the time. So I was able to, in 2013, lead the committee to develop the guidelines for the New York State Board um, prof professions um, to be able to share with um, our colleagues and profession, professionals in the field and the consumers, because the board does speak for consumers about protecting the consumers um, kind of needs and how they were, would be approached, so to speak, for telepractice. So I was able to create those guidelines and that was the spark that initiated so many other projects, and including at Adelphi creating the telepractice suite and creating a telepractice course that was provided to the students. So one of the courses that I taught at Adelphi was the, the, the course that I created on telepractice. So um, again, being the only person in the clinic that was doing telepractice at the time in 2017, 2018, 2019, and then 2020 comes and everybody needs to know about telepractice. Everybody needs to do telepractice in the clinic. And um, suddenly, you know, they, they were like, Dawn, haven't you been doing that for, a, you know, for a few couple of years already? And so I was able to use that skill. So it was, it was perfect timing. And again, you know, I take, you know, sometimes you, you take those opportunities to say yes to things that you're curious about and you're interested in, because I didn't know anything about telepractice, but I wanted to do this work. I wanted to work with this client 
And, um, and so I did it and it blossomed into something that was really necessary, of course, as we know, when everybody had shutdowns and nobody could go anywhere, how could we continue our services? And I continued pretty smoothly because I already had it in place. Right, so uh, just one more question and then I would like to move into a discussion of your business, if you don't mind. <laughs> you know? So uh, I would like to ask you, still part of the clinical realm, um, what will be a tool, will be a typical client that will require the services of a speech language, of the, a speech language uh, pathologist or an audiologist? So uh, the truth about our field is, and, and probably like most service fields, is that we really go from, so to speak, the cradle to the old age wheelchair, let's just say, um, because we do work with clients that, um, so I spent many years working with clients that were in a program called the Early Intervention Program um, in New York State. It's called the Early Intervention Program. A lot of states call it similar things. Um, and so those are zero, meaning babies, infants, to three-year-olds. And then of course, you know, through school, through preschool, et cetera. And on the other end, because lives are being saved, thankfully, through medical intervention, oftentimes, and people have extended lives, we now are working much more. And again, I'm saying now, meaning in history, but now working a lot with clients on the other end who have um, had uh, uh, strokes or have survived strokes, basically, who are living through these, you know, kind of things that would have killed people 30 years ago that are able to be saved now, but then need intervention for speech services to be able to continue to have a high quality of life on the other side of adulthood, so to speak. Um, and even, you know, those clients that can be saved from a traumatic brain injury, um, as adults who may get into a car crash and, you know, are, are therefore, you know, not able to, to speak in the way that they used to be able to speak and, and frankly breathe, you know, have their whole capacity to be able to provide, you know, voice to their needs. So, and, and then again, of course, we have um, the, the, the children that may be developmentally delayed. So children that have autism, Down syndrome, et cetera. Um, and, and these are just some of the, um, I would say the, the, the uh, characteristics that are pretty familiar to a lot of people, but children that have kind of long-term um, issues in speech services, for example, would also be part of our um, workload in the schools, as well as children that have the, the easier things like a nice, a nice cute lisp, <laughs> and they can't say, you know, S's clearly, or they can't say R's properly, things like that, that are more, um, I would say, straightforward and um, less uh, potentially, potentially long term. But again, for those reasons, you know, we have a, a wide range of clients that come for speech services so that they can have a higher quality of life and be able to communicate whether verbally or non-verbally because we have communication boards and communication devices that can speak to people. So again, for those reasons, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of ways that we work with clients over, over in speech pathology and a lot of people have various specialty areas. Right, I know that um, one of the areas where you specialize is in accent modification. <laughs> so I am wondering who needs uh, to have the accent modified and, uh, and uh, to what is it modified? Okay, that is an excellent question because it's actually a little bit controversial at times. Um, for sure, um, I've had an accent in my life. <laughs> and so I, I grew up in England and I came to America and I had a British accent. And although many people believe that a British accent is one of those that are you know, more highly valued in the moment as a young person coming to America and initially landed in Louisiana, um, my British accent as a young black woman seemed out of place <laughs> to those that I was speaking to. So although I didn't have accent modification, the idea of it was um, 
was was made aware that I needed to um, make myself clear in speaking situations. So there is that version of things where it's an internal uh, response, so to speak, to wanting to make yourself clear in professional and social situations that comes from the person that's speaking to say, I don't wanna have to explain where I come from every single time I open my mouth. So let me just, you know, let me see how this is gonna work and let me see if I can modify this. The other part of it though, um, which is more controversial is when it comes from outside of, um, outside of the kind of internal desires where somebody might really have problems having communication um, kind of stopped because people are negatively responding to the way that people speak. Now, let me be clear. My personal take on things is that there continues to be, no surprises here, a social strata of preferences of languages, or uh, sorry, languages, but speech patterns. So whether it's that you speak in a way that people think is intelligent or you and I'm using air quotes for this, or you speak in a way that people do not prefer, um, this can impact, um, and there has been enough studies done over the years that there is linguistic discrimination against people based on the way that they speak. Linguistic discrimination specifically means that if I go in for a job interview and I'm talking to you and I have any type of accent, whether it's a foreign accent or a regional American accent, and they, the listener does not appreciate it and has their own biases and discriminates against you and not give you the job, not give you the promotion, et cetera, then that is also something that, um, you know, it prompts people to get accent modification. It prompts them. Now, personally, I always use um, a couple of examples such as Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sofia Vergara who have very, very strong accents, but it has not held them back in any way, shape or form. And um, a lot of people, accepted the way that they spoke and frankly because of the skills that they had they made it so that you have to accept the way that they speak and both of these people have um have stories about how they tried to change their accent but then they realized first of all it's hard <laughs> and second of all and second of all it wasn't necessary they didn't want to do that and to me, I think that, you know, the qualities of accents are not, are, are not bad or good. There's things that I prefer too. I'm not going to say that there's things that I, you know, that I'm like, oh, I, you know, everything's perfect. But to the extent that I know, I know better that I'm, you know, open to making myself as a listener work a little bit harder to understand people better, that's on me. And I think that that part of it is, is important too. So yes, there is external and internal versions of things. There are reasons why people come to um, get accent modification. And, um, and, and what do they transfer to <laughs> was the last part of your question. And what's interesting, again, controversial, is that um, the, hmm, the past, <laughs> the past way of thinking about accent modification is to make a, what they call a general uh, US um, accent, right? So a general American accent. What does that really mean? It kind of means, <laughs> kind of means what you hear on newscasters, from newscasters on national television programs. So the way that they speak. Now, this is kind of, because the truth is, if you want a New York accent, you get a New York accent. You want a California accent, get a California accent. Texas, whatever. Um, but uh, but but for the you know for the general public, there is that kind of almost you know kind of towards that version of things. Um, my one of my current clients is from France, and so she already has a French accent. And French accents are beautiful, and they sound great, and a lot of people like them but she works with a lot of clients internationally. And so she wants to be clearer when she speaks English with those, the variety of clients that she works with. She, she likes the way that she speaks, but she knows that when she's speaking English, um, it could be pronounced differently. And she wants to know what those pronunciation skills could be. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. And it's, the, and it's helpful when it's helpful. 
If it's not helpful, don't do it. <laughs> you know, that I, I tell you that I'm sure that many people just heard that and are encouraged. Uh, and, uh, and I know that there is always, um, I think, in the minds of people, uh, who would say, I really would like to have, and I'm sure there are some of those people watching now who are saying to themselves, I really would like to have my accent modified, but I cannot afford it. <laughs> so <laughs> There's probably an app for that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but uh, this is really, this is really uh, great. I, I like the conversation that we're having. So now I'd like you to tell us about the business side of your work. Uh, because you founded uh, World Class Speech Services. Uh, and so uh, please tell us exactly uh, what you do. And I know it's from the clinical piece. It's not your academic work. It's the clinical aspect. Mm. But because practice informs uh, research and practice informs scholarship in that way, I don't want to say that they are distinct, uh, but what do you do at World Class Speech Service? So World Class Speech Services is a business that I've been, um, it's been incorporated for the last, well, next year we'll be celebrating 20 years. So I started the business as a subcontractor for um, various agencies working with um, clients for different things. So that's the, where the, the name came from, but I always wanted to do accent modification um, because of my own interest, like I said, in linguistics and languages and, you know, from my own experiences. So the name, you know, kind of came from that idea that I would be working with people internationally on their speech services, on their speech skills, excuse me. Um, so what World Class Speech Services does now is it focuses on professional voice use, um, so professionals in the workplace oftentimes need public speaking skills, presentation skills, um, as, as we said just, be, just now, accent modification um, and, and interpersonal communication. So I work with adults who are professionals, who are executives, who uh, need skills uh, to, to improve their own communication skills on the job. Um, and again, sometimes people come to me because they're looking for the... Um, the promotion, the next promotion. So they want to know how to, you know, brush up, sharpen up. And I think that there's room for all of us to improve over time, right? So as we go along, we just, you know, we, we do some, some more um, trainings to be able to get ourselves a little bit better at a particular area of our own lives. And the other part of it, of course, as you as we talked about before, is um, establishing and um, expanding telepractice programs. Um, as much as possible talking about telepractice on the professional level with professionals as well as with people that are um, establishing uh, and developing telepractice programs in clinics, hospitals, and academic programs, similar to what I did with um, Adelphi, being able to do needs assessments, be able to establish you know, um, a course of action to train people and um, so telepractice is also, you know, part of that. Um, and in addition to that, you know, I, I work on, I work on the other side of um, the career, so to speak, of course, because I am part of the licensing board, but also, you know, just in my own interest because the licensing board does what it does. And so, you know, it, 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 it is, it is, it is a, um, I want to say temporary part of, of life, but um, but the, the career of, of speech pathology and audiology, specifically audiology, um, has has fewer people, but speech pathology has you know a couple of thousand people, um, a few more um, in New York specifically, but um, but licenses, um, so we so we we do that you know, but that's not really part of world class speech services as much. It is just you know my interest for. For what I do. I know what's going to happen after this. People will contact me and say, uh, now that there is still a practice and it's something that she has really driven and uh, created uh, telepractice classes and teaches uh, telepractice and practices that uh, 
can we get her services even if we don't live in the United States? The answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is absolutely yes. I am um, open to working with people that are everywhere, frankly. Um, we have now the avenue to be able to communicate a lot more efficiently um, with most areas of the world, frankly. Um, and we need to because there are areas that are unfamiliar with speech pathology and audiology services, which is huge and um, in some ways disappointing, but also part of what life is, right? So we are in America, we think everything comes easy or that things are readily available to us. But the truth is, um, you know, I've worked with clients um, with a program called Smiles for Speech. So I worked with a child in Ghana and, um, and this is through the program. Um, but the point is that their, you know, their internet service is not that great and, you know, things like that. And that's one of the reasons why telepractice, it may or may not work, but they're not even a, able, frankly, to get the speech services where they are because there are not enough speech pathologists available to them there. And I know Ghana sounds like a far place from where we are in New York, but even in Jamaica, um, there are speech pathologists. But there are only a handful, like literally my understanding is that there are less than a dozen licensed speech pathologists in the island of Jamaica. And potentially, maybe that's not a problem. Maybe people don't need speech services in Jamaica and that's okay too. But if they do, and if they, if they have the ability to be able to recognize when something can be done and people can be helped and we have the skills to be able to do it, then you know there is an outreach program for that um, that can be you know can can be created. Again, you know, for me, I think you know I, I name my business world class speech services because I want to work internationally. I want to work with the world. I want to be able to reach as many people in as many different places. Probably out of my own sense of you know curiosity. You talked about how much I travel. I love traveling. <laughs> if I wasn't a speech pathologist, I would probably be a flight attendant <laughs> so that I could get to travel some more. Mm -hmm. But uh, but either way, <laughs> that is something that I'm always interested in. I'm interested in languages. I'm interested in seeing other people. I'm interested in talking to other people. Well, you know, sometimes people strike deals with me without even knowing that they're striking deals. And I think that you have just, uh, you and I have just struck a deal that you will go with me on a trip to Africa. Oh, yes. To, uh, to do some work there. And uh, it's interesting that you mentioned Ghana. So it's not a continent that you are unfamiliar with. Uh, and just as an aside, I talked about your extensive traveling at some point. Um, so I am tempted to ask you where you've been, but I won't because I know you've been everywhere. So what I should ask you is where haven't you been? I have not been to Nigeria. I'm going to say this <laughs> right now. So I'm ready to go. Ready to go. Oh, great. <laughs> That's a deal. <laughs> that is definitely a deal. Uh, I know that lately you have been interested. Well, not that you've been interested, but as far as mm -hmm. your work goes, Yes. You have been, you're really embracing a lot. And uh, because of your social consciousness and uh, all of that awareness, and I know that you have expanded your work to include diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. And so there is something that caught my eye that I would like you to speak to, because I know that there's a project uh, coming up in that respect. So if you don't mind, Yes. So one of one other arm, one one, one other arm of world class speech services um, is um, is how we we are addressing um, diversity within our our careers of audiology and speech pathology. The the latest demographics, what the demographics that were released from the American Speech and Hearing Association in 2020, I think put the numbers of um, the speech pathologists in this way. And this is traditional, this has been somewhat the same over the many years, but it's 95 or 94% white women. So specifically white women, and then 5% um, 
people of color. Now, I think that maybe it might expand to, it may, it may have expanded to 8%, so it might be 92% white women and 8% others, right? And what does others mean? Others means men, others means Asians, others means Latinos, others means black people, people of African descent and people that are, um, you know, that, that are part of the speech pathology program or speech pathology career and audiology careers that are within that very small percentage of the national organization's membership. So they do a survey every year, every year, and they put it out there and they release these numbers. And so one of the issues that we have, of course, is that there is a very a uh, strong distinction between those who kind of get into speech pathology, know about speech pathology, and are exposed, frankly, to speech pathology and, and the, the skills that we have and the, the careers that we have and the people that we work with. Um, and the majority of those are people that are traditionally already in the field, right? So somebody who's in the field tells their niece and their niece becomes a speech pathologist, et cetera. And that is something that, although potentially, of course, is good. And if somebody sees somebody and is, is, is admiring them and what they do, and they want to follow in their footsteps, that's great. But the issue is, of course, that we, as people of color, um, BIPOC and men, um, tend not to get that information and not get those resources. And frankly, the other part of that is that there are um, some obstacles to getting into the field because um, one of the things about accent modification or um, the way that people speak patterns of speech is that um, you know with with um, some non-traditional or non-standard ways of speaking they say you're not good enough to be a speech pathologist and again this is you know younger people that are trying to get into the field that are trying to help with this career so the truth is for me the DEI speech IQ um, podcast that I'm starting is going to have discussions from myself and others who over the past you know, few years have really been investigating, looking into understanding um, and, and working towards anti-racist and social justice um, actions that can um, allow us to be more of a voice at the table, more of a um, you know, resource um, in, in in speech and hearing sciences and can get the jobs <laughs> and the exposure that other people get um, kind of without jumping through hoops. <laughs> so I'm saying this because, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, with the, the demographics as it is, we are oftentimes, you know, face uh, sitting face to face with somebody that's not like us. And, you know, we have to prove ourselves, you know, as they say, twice as hard, we have to work twice as hard for the things that other people seem to get very easily. And um, so for me, it's definitely um, glaringly obvious and has been for many years, but thankfully the movement is towards actual progress and some actionable steps that a lot of people are probably a little bit more ready for. I don't know that they're like, yay, come on, open arms, let's do this, believe me. <laughs> but I think that there is, you know, a crack in the opening to be able to, you know, kind of get in there and continue the work um, of those activists um, on whose shoulders we stand, of course. So over the years, you know, these are people that have already been doing the work. Sure, so that show uh, debuts on January 20th. Yes. On LinkedIn. Yes, yes, LinkedIn Live. Right. I promised you that I would only take 30 to 40 minutes of your time. Uh, what I did not remember to tell you at the time was that uh, as an African, the clock doesn't really mean so much. <laughs> uh, so we know when we'll start, but we don't know when we'll end. And so I have actually taken at least uh, a lot of your time already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's my so, pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank right. you. So here is what I like you to promise before you go. I always like the commitment from every one of my guests. It is that after the show debuts on the 20th, mm -hmm. you'll come back to us uh, probably in February and uh, at, uh, a bigger forum, which is going to be an international stage. I would like to have you uh, back. Um, 
possibly in February, if you don't mind, if you're not somewhere else in the world. It doesn't matter. Where I would love to. No, this is good. That'll be great. Wonderful. So I look forward to that. Yes. And Thank so you. I, I know you've been, you have, um, you have a lot to do. And uh, <laughs> so I'm going to let you go. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to me. And thank you for the, the support that you've given me through the years and um, at Adelphi. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate all the, you know, that we've, that we've talked about and that you've shared with me. So thank you. Right. So if you just want uh, to give some final words uh, to our audience. Yeah. So I, I would say that, um, of course, feel free to contact me and get in touch with me through LinkedIn, which is, you know, the professional site. Um, I do have other social media, so you can certainly find world-class speech services on Facebook and also on Instagram. Um, as we you know, move through 2022, I will be expanding world-class speech services um, and be, be focused on, on what, what I'm doing there also. So if anybody needs services and to follow up with me, feel free to do so. I, you know, again, I appreciate what you're doing here and, um, and, and I look forward to meeting some of your viewers. Right, so Professor Don Cotter Jenkins, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we'll be talking. Yes.